All right, give it a minute here. Letting people build here. People are joining right now. We'll get started in one minute. Got about 40 people here. Another couple of seconds. All right, well, why don't we get started? Well, welcome everybody. My name is Tom Manitas. Uh, this is another session of Tom Manitas Jobs Career Panels. We're focusing today on summer interns. And those of you that are intern in internships and looking for uh, career advice, both uh, immediately for your internship and then going forward. Boy, do we have the panel for you. A great lineup of bipartisan uh, folks who have been extremely successful in their careers, um, each from different paths uh, and different parts of the country and different parties. Um, but let me let me first describe what Tom Manitas Jobs is. Um, I didn't just name the website after myself because I'm an egomaniac. Um, we named it this because way back when I was in, uh, got my start on Capitol Hill and Nancy Pelosi's office, um, I saw a bunch of job postings coming through my email, and this is before Twitter and Facebook and social media. And I started forwarding those job postings to people that I knew who were looking for jobs. Uh, and as time went on, the list grew and grew. And I, I, I met uh, a wonderful person who I ended up marrying from the, from the other party who was working for President Bush at the time. And she encouraged me to launch a website uh, that did this for everybody. So what we do is we seek to post job postings, whether they're Capitol Hill, policy jobs, campaign jobs, nonprofits, private sector, you name it, anything in the politics and policy space so that we try to lower the bar a little bit on getting a job or internship into this world of politics, government and policy. Um, so regardless of party or background or issue focus, we hopefully get as many jobs as we can out there. Uh, there's a free daily email that goes out uh, at 9.15 a.m. every morning. Uh, and then there, th that captures the last 24 hours of job or internships postings. Uh, so hope you hope you join, but hopefully the resources like this that live on our website uh, and we do live as well um, are helpful to you. But before we get started in the questions, let me go through and uh, let everyone introduce themselves. Um, I'll do uh, ladies first with Alexandra followed by Sally Rose and then Carlos. And instead of butchering their introductions and talking about their backgrounds, I'm going to turn it over to them to both describe what they do now and then how they got their start in politics and policy. And um, and then we'll get on some tips. So Alexandra, you wanna kick it off? Thanks, Tom, super honored to be here. Um, so I lead public policy for the Americas and Emerging Markets at YouTube. Uh, I've been in this job about a year, uh, which means that um, I, uh, despite working for Google, I've never been into the Google office. Um, before that, uh, I ran government affairs for North America at Tesla and then previously at a company called CSRA. And then before that, um, I did about four years in the Obama administration at the Department of Homeland Security and in the White House Office of Ledge Affairs. I uh, spent about seven and a half years before that working for Nancy Pelosi, where I got to know Tom and Carlos, uh, and got my start on Capitol Hill in 2003, uh, working for Senator Barbara Mikulski of Maryland, uh, and moved to DC because I wanted to change the world. Um, knocked on a lot of doors, did a lot of informational interviews, turned one informational interview into three and three into nine, uh, and really built my career from the ground up that way. Sally Rose, you want to take it away? Hey, everyone. I'm Sally Rose Larson. I'm the Vice President of Government Relations for the Digital Media Association. We represent the major music streaming services. And in that role, I lobby. I work on some of our public affairs um, and public relations work. And I generally represent the industry before Congress and other uh, policymakers. Um, before joining DEMA, I was with Congressman Doug Collins from Georgia and I was his deputy chief of staff and legislative director. I also was the copyright advisor to the House Judiciary Committee um, when Congressman Collins was the ranking member of that committee. I'm, I'm from Georgia, so it was great to work for a home state member. And that's actually how I got my start on the Hill. I interned um, with my congressman at the time, Congressman Phil Gingrey. And uh, when I was in college, and when I graduated from college, I was lucky enough that he had an opening and I started in his office as staff assistant and then worked my way up to being a senior legislative assistant with him. Um, and I was very lucky that when he left Congress, uh, Doug Collins, also from Georgia, on the Judiciary Committee, which was the issue I wanted to handle, 
um, had an opening. So that's that's how I ended up here. Thanks, Kelly Rose. Carlos? Hi, I'm Carlos. Uh, I am Senator Lujan's chief of staff. Prior to being Senator Lujan's chief of staff, I worked in his leadership office in the House when he was the speaker. I, I've been the executive director of the Democratic Caucus in the House, the chief of staff to Joaquin Castro, uh, worked with Tom and Alexandra in Speaker Pelosi's office for about six years. Uh, and before that, I was the communications director for the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. In between, I've done a few presidential campaigns for uh, for President Obama, for Hillary Clinton, uh, Mike Bloomberg. Uh, and my, I, I came to politics in a, not a unique way, but in, in, I took a different route in that I was getting my master's uh, in, my, in, in the school down in South Texas when somebody told me that they needed Spanish speakers on the, on the Kerry campaign. Um, it turned out that they didn't need Spanish speakers, that the DCCC needed Spanish speakers. So anyways, I went and, and, and helped on the campaign and met folks from South Texas who worked for, for, for then leader Nancy Pelosi, um, who uh, generally told me that they needed, that, that, that I was smart and that I was hardworking and they needed more Hispanics like that in DC. And they offered to help me find a job. And I said, what the hell? So I came. Uh, and I was actually a high school teacher at the time. Uh, a very young high school teacher, but I was actually teaching high school at the time uh, when I was in politics. And I will be honest, um, unlike say Tom or Alexandra, who I know came here uh, with a vision of, of making a difference, by like coming to DC was the far, farthest thing away from my mind when I actually got to DC. Uh, and I said I was gonna stay five years and 16 and a half years later, here I am, so. Love it. Great stories, great background, great context. Hopefully we'll relate to a lot of people watching today. Um, let's start, the first question is, um, that was submitted before by some of the participants in this, in this webinar. What is the number one thing you look for when inter interviewing for interns? So at a time when um, you know people come to DC and intern, uh, what are the, some of the things that you look for most to what qualities, both that we're really looking to hire an intern and then when they're there, what qualities do you want to see and how they work to that would impress you? Um, Alexander, do you want to start? Yeah, thanks, Tom. I'm going to call it two things specifically. So the first that I thing that I look for is horsepower, by which I mean uh, people who uh, lean into challenges, bring a lot of hustle, uh, come to work really hard, um, and, and just extremely intellectually hungry. Uh, the other thing that I look for that I think is really important when you're on the job is a sense of humility. Um, interns definitionally know the least of anybody uh, in that workplace. And, and that's okay, That that's actually exactly as it should be. Um, and so uh, I look for interns who come with that sort of learner's mind, um, but have a sense of humility about what they do and don't know. Kelly Rose. Yeah, I think Alexander said it really, really well. I think um, hungry and humility are two things I would definitely, definitely echo. And I'd also say preparation and professionalism. I think, you know, you're not expected to know everything about the member of Congress when you interview or even when you're there, but you should know something about them. And when you're interviewing, if you've kind of taken the time to do the work, um, that really shows and it sets you apart. And professionalism. I mean, you're you're new to the workforce. You're not expected to you know, know everything again, but to come in and you know be ready to work and be ready to kind of interact with people and just put yourself um, put your best foot forward each and every day. That's great, Carlos. Can I ask you to take a little bit more of a, um, a, a turn on this specific question? As a chief of staff, when you're you know interacting with interns, what are the things that impress you most? Sure, you know, I will. I and. Full disclosure, Alexander is a really, really good friend of mine. But I would like, she stole my answer word for word. Like that is exactly what I what I look for in, in an intern. Uh, and the humility part more than anything else. Um, because at that level, one, everybody knows the least, but two, like the job, anybody can do the job. It's just like, are you gonna, you know, bring the certain can-do attitude that is required to do some of the grunt work, but also like stay late to see some of the cool stuff. Uh, and to answer your question directly, Tom, about the chief of staff, look, if if you're looking for a job on the Hill, obviously a state connection like Sally Rose had is, is, is uh, you know, if you come to me and you're from New Mexico, automatic uh, next round, you know, so that's always important. Um, 
if you reflect the, the diversity of your state, also uh, an, an automatic uh, pass to the second round. But then honestly, it's just like, are you hungry and will you be humble? Um, you know, like the one thing that I was, that struck me early on when I was young and, and starting this place is like, yeah, everybody here is smart. Um, everybody here knows what's going on. And so if, if you're counting on that to be the difference maker, like you, you're already maybe not a step behind, but you're not a step ahead. So then at that point, it's just what else are you bringing to the table? Um, and, and, and that's what I would encourage young people to focus on. Um, and I think, you know, a can-do attitude and humility are two things that, um, look, it's hard for even people that have careers to, to sort of figure out their place in the hierarchy. But for some reason, it's sometimes hard for young people to, you know, you want to get the job so much that you start, you know, or puffing your chest or sort of trying to show how much you know when it's quite the opposite that I think will get you the job, which is a person that, you know, can follow instructions correctly, um, isn't afraid to ask questions, you know, but, but will not, will come in early or stay late until the job is done. Yeah, Carlos, you stole part of my answer too. It's, uh, I was told the trick early on, be the, figure out when all the interns show up and show up 15 or 30 minutes early. And then when they leave, stay 15 or 30 minutes late and you will be known as the hardest working intern ever. And that was the advice that was given to me when I interned for Senator Paul Sarbanes, I did that. And I'd have staffers walk by my desk like, wow, you were the hardest working intern ever. And I would just like giggle to myself because that's exactly the, the thing that the person predicted. Also, it's, it's hard work and attention to detail. Um, and don't act like you know it all, just prove that you know it all, that you know that you're doing by doing it, doing the job and doing it well and triple and dub, double and triple checking your work to make sure it's complete. Uh, Cause that's been a, a, an additional thing that's been successful for people. Um, two questions and Carlos, if you, you don't mind, I'm gonna stay on you and then go to, um, go to Sally Rose and cause Sally Rose as an LD, I'd like your advice on this. Um, are you ever too young for a role on Capitol Hill? You know, I've actually had some personal experience with this. Um, and the short answer is, yeah, you are. I mean, like this is, and I don't know if it's too young as a thing, but like sometimes your like your experience, uh, your know-how, your your your, your skill set is right on the cusp of being able to do that job, but not quite there. And in fact, uh, I applied to work for Speaker Pelosi before I started working with her. I had applied to work with her about a year earlier, and uh, the communications director at the time was like, "Man, I really like you. I think you've, you, know, I think you've got something, but you know, this other person just has more experience, more whatever." And I didn't get the job, and. Um, and obviously your instinct is to, you know, complain or like sort of, sh sort of show how you can do the job. Um, but as a friend of mine who worked for Pelosi, who, uh, who I told like, hey, you know, is there anything we can do here? And he was like, you're better off. Like you're, you're actually not ready to do this job. Like if you had gotten the job, no matter how much they like you, like you, you have a higher likely, uh, more, more likely to fail. It doesn't mean you have to fail, but you're more likely to fail. So you know, my opinion is you can be, and I'm not too young, but you cannot, sometimes you might not have the, you, know, you might not have built up the skill set yet. Um, now, but you know, this was 16 years ago. So I think things definitely changed. Um, so, but that's, that's my personal experience with it. Kelly Rose? That's, I, I would say almost exactly the same answer I have. I don't think it, you know, I think there's there's such a thing as too young, but it's not really about the age. It's more about the experience and experience is the most kind of important thing here. And then just having the self-awareness to recognize your own level of experience. And, you know, I think you have to also have the awareness. You don't want to hold yourself back by, you know, because you'll, you might never feel totally ready for a job, but you also have to recognize coming, you know, your first job on the Hill might not be an, an LD job. That's very rare. And just kind of recognizing um, your own experiences and how they would contribute to a role. That's great. And then we just had a, a live question come in and Alexander, I'd like to kick it to you saying, I'm a, I'm a month into my first internship and I'm a um, graduate. I've already started applying for a staff assistant in LC roles. How can I stand out from the other candidates? What would you suggest? One of the things I always suggest to people is oftentimes um, uh, applications request writing samples, or even if, uh, even if a writing sample is not requested, it's you know, something you could voluntarily send in. And I think that something that makes a candidate really stand out. And again, you're just trying to get to the top of that pile so that you can get a call to come in for an interview and show off your stuff is um, 
to draft a writing sample that is specific for that office and in the voice of that office. So it could be a memo to the member of Congress about uh, a, certain, a certain bill on the floor, or it could be an op-ed, or it could be a press release. But um, to me, that shows that you're really pursuing that single opportunity that you want to work for that individual member of Congress. And I think that um, catches, catches the hiring manager's eye. Carlos, any advice there? Actually, yeah, again, Alexander stole my answer. I shouldn't, I shouldn't go after her. But yeah, I think, I think doing something specific for the office that you're going after is, um, is just a smart way to, to, get a, to, get a, to move your, your name to the top of the list. Um, as we all know, when we're, when we're doing these, particularly on the more junior roles, the applications can come in like in droves. And so, you know, to, to sort of sort that out, um, things like that help you stand out. And then honestly, this is gonna, you know, sound a little tried, but like doing the, doing the, doing the informational interviews, making sure you put your, your best foot forward. You know, if somebody, I, I, I go to my friends, Alexander and Tom included to, for resumes and they, and they tell me, hey, I met with this person and I think they really have something. Like I, I trust people that I know do good work. I trust their word about what good work looks like. And if they tell me, hey, this kid's got something, I'm gonna immediately wanna bring that person in um, for an interview. So doing, um, doing that networking and doing it right, right? Like do, saying, sending the follow-up email, thanking them for meeting, asking if they can meet with somebody else, being cognizant of the fact that you're asking for somebody who's busy and you're asking them for their time and being flexible and all that good stuff. Um, I think doing that right goes a long way. Right. I think networking is so key to getting a job. Uh, you can apply all you want, but if no one is weighing in on your behalf, it's tough to get your, your resume out of that pile. Sally Rose, can you speak to um, that specific point? Where has networking helped you in the past um, or help people you know get those jobs uh, early on in their career? Yeah, absolutely. I think, I mean, networking is is absolutely key and it's um, using the connections that you have. You know, look at your alumni networks, look at uh, people you know from your office or from a former internship. Um, it, it certainly helped me. My first boss on the Hill ran for Senate um, and did not make it past the primary. And it was, you know, I was kind of freaking out to be honest. And, and I had reached out to my network of people and let them know I was looking for a job. And, you know, people would send me job opportunities or more often than not would just say, maybe it's a good idea to talk to this person. Um, that person, you know, I've, I've kept relationships with a lot of those people and those networks um, have not only helped me to fill positions when I was hiring um, people when I was still on the Hill, but have also helped me uh, to, you know, even to get this job. Um, so which it's great. And so I think it's just really important to you know, stay in touch with people. Networking should be more than just one coffee. It should be um, following up, checking in with people and really building a relationship and that, um, that there's, it's invaluable to have that. Alexander, you're someone who I was bragging earlier has had a very interesting career where you've worked in, on, for the Senate, the House Speaker, uh, Cabinet Secretary, the White House, uh, fascinating companies. How has networking helped you specifically in your career? Well, I, th I think people think about networking um, in a sometimes overly simple way, which is just uh, opening doors. And that is a part of networking, but the other part of networking is actually learning from the people that you network with. And so what I would say is that I have learned a ton about how the world works, about how DC works um, from people who are in different points of their career than I am, or uh, uh, you know, sort of seeing the DC puzzle from a different angle. So, um, you know, anytime you have a networking opportunity, I think there's two goals. Uh, you know, the first is to ingratiate yourself and, and create an ally, somebody who will be, um, you know, help you introduce you to other people, help you with opportunities. But the second, and, and I think we should never miss the second part of the opportunity, and that's the real learning. Um, and I will tell you, I'm now um, 18 years into my career in DC, and every year I think, 
okay, this is the year that I figured out DC. Like, you know, I worked in the Senate and then I got to the house and I thought I figured it out. And then all of a sudden I was working for the speaker of the house and I was like, okay, I can see the whole, you know, chessboard from here. And then, you know, I got to the executive branch and thought I knew nothing. And then, you know, now a couple of jobs in industry, I realized there's just all these different pieces of the puzzle that you're, you're trying to figure out, you're trying to grow your skill set, uh, And uh, that's a really, really important piece of networking too. Great. We have two similar questions, one submitted before and one just uh, submitted here. It, it's about being an introvert. So when you're an introvert, it doesn't might not come naturally to you to network. And personally, it seems like I'm an extrovert, which I am partially. But when I was in it, when I was unemployed for four months after the Obama reelection campaign, I had to force myself every single day to network, do networking coffees and lunches and just put myself out there, talk about myself and market myself for future jobs while at the same time as being humble and taking people's advice and learning from their stories and networking your way to those jobs. But for those that are introverts, can you all tell me some tricks uh, to deal with that? Um, and, I, and I have a sense that I would bet that most all of you have not always been comfortable in, about networking, um, similar to everyone, even though we all seem like we're okay with it. Uh, Carlos, you wanna start us off and then go to Sally Rose? Sure. And, and you're spot on, Tom. Uh, you know, even to Alexander's point, this is my 16th year on the Hill and I'm a new Senate chief. And like, yeah, all, all, like a big part of what I'm doing is, is meeting other chiefs who have done it before. Chiefs that came from the House, chiefs that were first time chiefs that they were in LDs in the Senate uh, and just different, getting different perspectives on the same job so that I know, so I have, so I have a better understanding of what the job is and how I can do my part to help uh, my boss succeed. Um, yeah, and I, I think, look, you approach uh, getting an internship or getting a job like it is a job. And you, you know, I'm fortunate that I really enjoy my job and, and, and really enjoy Congress. But yeah, not every day I wanna get up and go to work, but I get, every day I come and get up and go to work. And so, you know, networking should be the same thing. And, and I think much like coming to work, once I get here, I'm like, oh yeah, I really like this place and I really like my job. Um, I, I feel like particularly um, when you're younger, uh, but even now, like when I, I'll use myself as an example, every time I go meet with a new chief, you could tell that the other person is generally wants to help you. Um, look, everybody's been with, everybody's been on that first, everybody's taking that first step. And so we, and, and most people remember what that, how hard that first step was. And so everybody, and most people you meet will be wanting you to get that first step in. And, 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 and so once you start, once you do the, the hard work of just getting yourself to a, a coffee or getting on a Zoom, like you will see that and you, and you come prepared, um, then you will see the, 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 the fruits of that labor. And I, would, and I would say this as an introvert, masquerading as an extrovert, um, the good thing I think about being an introvert is that you, because you, you know the, the, the chit chat and the and the small talk doesn't come so naturally, I often feel like I over prepare for some of these things because I can't like fill in the time the, or fill in the conversation. So I want to come in and, and like not waste time and, and sort of come here for what I want to do, and then and being and being prepared and, and and having those questions, just the conversation just starts come coming so so much more naturally. And then like there's a point where you don't even refer to your questions anymore because you're so deep into the network conversation. And, and, and I think that's the best kind of a, a networking. And as an introvert, that's the approach I would take. Sorry, Rose. Sorry, so I'm mute. Um, I would echo Carlos. I think it, it can feel, at least for me, it felt at times and still feels, um, as we're meeting new people, kind of intimidating and awkward. And I think the, the great thing about DC is that most people have had this experience. They've had to get their foot in the door some way. And so they want to help you. And so remembering that like, these people have been in that same position, um, I think that makes it a little bit easier. You know, people are used to getting kind of cold emails or outreach. They want to help people and they were, were there once. And then I think that asking good questions is a great, great um, piece of advice too, and it kind of goes back to Alexandra's point, one, asking questions, you want to come prepared with them, but it lets the person you're meeting with do some of the talking, take some of the, the pressure off of you to fill in the conversation, but it also gives you a learning experience to hear um, about other people's experiences, how they got there, and it helps the conversation to flow more naturally. 
And then again, I think it's just being prepared, you know, know a little bit about, if not the person you're speaking to, the member they work for, or, you know, it, did they go to the same school as you? Know a little bit about them so you, if possible, have some kind of um, mutual conversation point, and that can help it to feel a little bit less awkward too. You know, if you both went to the same college, maybe you have a, a shared memory, a shared professor, something like that. It just helps things to feel a little bit less forced sometimes. Great piece of advice. Don't waste your time networking with somebody or even, you know, seeing them at a reception, wasting their time on asking their, their history. Like, do the LinkedIn search and do the Googling to figure out like what their backgrounds you have that talking point, you have that question to ask. Um, so you use that time to either connect with them or gather valuable information for them about, you know, what you're seeking to help with, whether job search or internship search. Um, Alexander, let me, let me ask a, a very specific question that was, um, that could apply to all of you is that, you know, when you're in a um, reception um, type environment, hopefully we get back to those more often, and you find yourself, you know, as a minority in the room, whether you're the only woman or the only person of color in the room, like, how do you make yourself feel more comfortable? Or how do you how do you deal with that? Because that is often uh, a time, a, a, a situation multiple people have written in saying that they encounter and, and want, want your advice on dealing with. Yeah, that I mean, that's a, um, that's a really good question. And what I would say is that um, uh, the humility uh, of of um, being an introvert or of being um, underrepresented in some way is actually a superpower. And so, you know, going back to my first um, my first question, where I said, you know, what, when Tom asked what I was looking for an intern, and I said humility, I, I would um, I would really think about the the fact that you feel different as the source of your strength and that you can bring uh, a different perspective that is much, much needed in this town and I think is increasingly valued um, and, and really lean into that as um, I'm here to bring something different. I'm, I have a unique value add here because I have a unique perspective that deserves to be heard. And um, the people who value those diverse perspectives will, will recognize that in you. Um, and so again, just try and try and turn um, your like your your fear, your nervousness uh, into into power. Would be my advice. Carl, thanks, Alexander. Carl, what about you? Yeah, I, I agree um, with Alexander, and 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 I think what is where it is, and it's and it's refreshing, and it's helpful, and it's and it's needed, and it's overdue. But but where young people are lucky right now. Um, look, when I got to the hill there was less Hispanics than there are now. When my mentors who, were, who are Hispanic got to the hill, there was even less, right? So you sort of see the, the evolution of that. And right now, like, again, I'll use the center as, as, as an example. There are five Hispanic chiefs of staff, which is more than we've ever had. Um, and so to Alex, I, I on this point, you use that as a sense of, of power, a sense of pride and, and, a, and a, a perspective that is still unique hopefully one day it won't it won't like you know its uniqueness will lose its value because we have so many you know african americans or women or hispanics or lgbt folks on the hill but now it's still a uh, a, a perspective that is needed and um unlike let's say 16 years ago now it's actually people see the wisdom of it the value of it that it's like not only is it like a good thing to do but it's also just good for business um and and like, i think once those two things intersect that it's like a, the right thing to do but it's also good for the bottom line whether you are you know a lobby shop or you're a member of congress uh that having that different perspective um uh, is value add you're you're you know you're in a good place and if you can sort of make that connection for folks or just further highlight that connection for folks um i think it's actually a very powerful thing you know, we're, I'm sorry to skip, keep going quickly, but we're getting a ton of questions. Sally Rose, how, and can, start with Sally Rose, but I'd love each of your perspectives on this one. In We're now over a year, and I'm unfortunately into this COVID era. What are some good ways to network still when it's harder to get in, in person with people and people are more default on Zoom and phone calls? What have you all seen as successful ways at networking in this COVID era? Sally Rose, and the one Sally Rose, Alexander, Carlos. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's definitely can be a little bit more challenging to feel that real connection, but I think you can still reach out to people and ask them to jump on a Zoom, jump on a phone call, and you can gauge people's comfort level to see if they're, you know, if you live in the same neighborhood, if it's convenient, whatever it may be, and to get coffee in person. I, but I think don't let not being in person, um, don't let that inhibit you from reaching out to people because in some ways it's it's even easier to jump on a Zoom than to go and meet with someone. Um, so, and you know, you can even pitch it to a person, like you have 10 minutes to talk. It doesn't have to be full 30 minutes, but making that initial step in the door and then following up with people. I mean, I think that's the most important piece, especially right now when you're not just gonna like randomly bump into someone you may have met. Um, I think to me, the follow-up can be like the even harder part than the initial outreach. So looking for ways to follow up if you see something great their boss did that you may have talked about, you know, send them an email and say, this is really cool. Or if you see a, an article um, about something you had talked about, you know, flag that for them, look for little excuses to get in. And that's a way to keep the network, the networking going, even if you're not seeing people in person uh, frequently. Sally Rose totally nailed it there. And the point that I would just really emphasize is that the um, the single point of failure on networking, I find, is on the follow-up. The people, I meet with people for half an hour. In the pre-pandemic world, that takes an hour of my time, right? Because 15 minutes there, 15 minutes back. And then I never hear from them and again. And so I'm I, like that, that me as a continuing resource, both as network and as knowledge is lost. And I think the way that uh, Sally Rose put that is so perfect. You can send emails that don't even really require a response. My favorite kind of email to get is like a good news email, like, hey, just wanted to let you know that, you know, I, I got a promotion in my office that I'm moving to a new office. And you, the, the advice you gave me three years ago was so instrumental in this, even if that's not even quite true, even if it's just flattery. Um, I think continuing to maintain that relationship, once you've done that sort of initial networking engagement, you should see yourself as having an obligation for a, a continuing relationship in order to make the most of that content. Great, Carlos. Yeah, I agree with both points. And I think, and if I'm being sincere, man, like Zoom is actually better than in-person. Like it's just, it's easier for everybody. Um, the other thing I would emphasize is like, if you're gonna ask for a Zoom, you know, be prepared, offer the link, um, make sure that you're flexible on time, uh, make sure that you're there, on, that you're on the, on the link on time. Uh, that's the only thing that, that I think I would emphasize of what has been said. But I think honest, and I will say this, uh, I, I, I try to be as helpful as possible to young people. When people ask me to get on a call, I do, and that's helpful, and, I, and I'll do it. But it, when you put a, a face to a name, like it's just a different connection, and, and, and you sort of like, and that way, when you see them in public at a reception or wherever, you're like, hey, it's me. Uh, I, Tom and I were just talking about one of these panels we did, and, and Tom saw the uh, one of the interns at the White House, you know, whatever, sometime later. But like, if had that been a phone call, you know, that kid wouldn't, Tom would not recognize that kid. So um, I think there's a lot of value in Zoom. All great advice. Um, shifting gears a little bit, uh, talking about campaigns. Um, we got a, two questions, I'll read them both. Um, coming out of college, what do you recommend as your first career move? Do you try to work on campaigns, work on the Hill? I wanted to do both, but I'm not sure on timing. And then what insights do you give on career movement between campaigns and congressional work? Um, probably the, the person with definitely the most campaign experience is Carl. So Carl, let me kick it to you. And then I love um, both Sally Rose and Alexander's thoughts as well. Um, I would say there's no, there's no wrong sequence, like campaign first and then Congress or Congress first and then campaigns. Um, if you have an opportunity to do both, I strongly recommend doing both. I have this running joke that I tell folks where I campaign people I'm conv are convinced that I know Congress and Congress people are convinced that I know campaigns. And like just that's just a sweet spot to be in. Um, and it's, and you know, the running joke is like, there's very few people to do that. So you're, you're able to sort of um, occupy that space because it's less crowded. Uh, but there's no, there's no wrong sequence to do it. I will say it is very helpful to have done a campaign to do the policy and, and vice versa like do you need to no um but it is it is very helpful and it's just a, a unique perspective i'll give you a quick anecdote i remember in 2013 i hired a my scheduler coming off the obama campaign and she was like i'm 2012 she was just so jazzed about obama and she was young and she was like i'm i come here to change the world 
And she got to co Congress and she's like, oh, this place kind of sucks. Um, and I was like, okay, like she just didn't enjoy herself. She enjoyed, it was just a, 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 such a contrast. Like, oh, you enjoy campaigns. Like that's what you enjoy. So um, it's also just a, a, an easy way to figure out what you really enjoy doing. Um, but I, I, like, I've done both and I strongly recommend doing both. It is just uh, like Alexander said in the very beginning, you think you have a place figured out and you go do something else and you're like, oh, I only slightly have it figured out. There's this whole other world. Um, uh, and you'd be amazed how, how related campaigning and working on the Hill is and how few people have done both. Like that's just like, that, that's what always amazed me. All right. I, I agree 100%. I think there's not a right or wrong answer which you do first, but campaign experience is really invaluable. Um, I've never worked full time on a campaign, but I've volunteered on several. And at times that's been, you know, two or three weeks of kind of full time volunteering. Other times it's been like on the weekends, I would do it. But I think just having the exposure to a campaign, of course, it's not the same as working full time, but it, it really gives you a different perspective on, you, know, you get to know the state in a way that you may not, if you're working in a DC office, you get to know a district, you get to know um, potentially the member in a different way. You, there, you're, there's just different relationships that you build. And it's it's such an intense environment at times that I think it, it builds really strong relationships. Um, but there, it, it also can help to know the politics a little bit more. I think there's times um, people in DC who are especially on the policy side um, who have only done that can focus really deeply on policy. And that's a good thing and you need those people, but you have to also know how to kind of communicate that and, and what people in the state think and or in the district think. And I think campaign experience can really help to be eye-opening on from that perspective. Alexandra? Look, the thing I love about DC is that you don't actually have to choose. And so what, what I would suggest is that um, folks starting out in their career think about the organizing principles for the kind of jobs that they want to seek. So what I, I always um, operationalized around uh, having maximum impact, so seeking uh, jobs that were meaningful and then jobs that were interesting uh, because boring jobs are boring. Um, and so that, that was sort of the question I asked myself at every um, uh, uh, break in the road, is this new opportunity more meaningful and more interesting than what I'm currently doing? And um, I think sometimes if you zoom out and ask yourself those big questions, uh, it, it makes uh, choices like that one more clear. And, and if oh. I may, Tom, the only thing yeah. I forgot to mention that I think is, I think Alexander is completely right um, to approach it that way. The last thing I would say is the one, the sort of the best thing about campaigns, particularly congressional campaigns and smaller campaigns, is they're like dog years of experience. Like a congressional office has a has a hierarchy, right? If you're the communications director, if you're the if, you know if you're the communications intern, you're not going to do what the communications director is doing because you're the communications intern. But in a campaign. Like you could be the communications intern one day and be the press secretary the next because like they're on a shoestring budget because a lot of people are volunteering and because like, like the job just needs to get done. Um, and, and, so, and on congressional campaigns, more often than not, the job just goes to the person that's always present. Um, so it's, it's literally like dog years of experience. Things that you're allowed to do in a campaign would take you years to do in a congressional office. Amen. I was on the Gore campaign when I was 20 and I turned 21 and I was handling millions of dollars a week spending that, sending advanced people all over the country. I still haven't managed that kind of budget of my career and I'm, I'm close to 20 years. So you just get so much experience in campaigns. Um, you, the bonds you develop on campaigns, because anytime you go through something really tough with somebody, it creates that natural bond. Um, campaigns are like that. And congressional offices and Executive branch can be, but campaigns are just so much more intense in a short period of time. So some of my best friends in the world are from the hardest jobs I've had. And that usually is on the campaign side. And other things on, on Sally Rose's point on volunteering campaigns, just because you're working on the Hill doesn't mean you can't take a couple of weeks off right before the election and go volunteer on a campaign. In fact, a lot of bosses like you to do that so they can show that they're helping out the team of the party that you're working in. And one of those times there's a special election up in Buffalo, New York, and I was a junior person in Pelosi's office, you know, doing walk packets. And I recognized this old guy who walked in the office and I thought he was like an important person on the Hill, but I just paid attention to him and worked my butt off and gave him like extra attention, him and his deputy. 
Well, it turned out th- two or two years later, he was my chief of staff in Pelosi's office. And then his deputy was eventually Nancy Pelosi's, another chief, one of her chiefs of staff. And he remembered me giving him that, you know, extra attention and working my butt off and that hardworking junior guy on that, on that campaign. And you'll never know who you're run into. Um, also, one last thing on campaigns, everyone in DC is there because they want a campaign. So either if it was a, a president in a home country appointed an ambassador, they're there because that person who sent them there won a campaign. Uh, the president and all of his or her, you know, folks littered an entire administration are there because they won a, a campaign and same with Congress. So there are very few people, unless you're working for the federal government in a, in a, in a um, career job, but you're still there because you're working because of a vision of people who have won campaigns. So it just helps to have that understanding um, of what got people there when you're working in this in this field. Um, I don't want to keep you guys too much longer. So just one other question, actually two, I lied, two questions. One, um, you all have worked crazy busy jobs. So whether it's campaigns, Capitol Hill, private sector, have you ever felt like it impeded your development in other parts of life? And kind of how have you balanced that? We've got a couple of different questions on like, I hear you, you work really long hours in down the hill or whatever. And has that uh, altered other parts of your life? And are there times to shift gears depending on what else is going into your personal life? And I know that's like a deeply personal question, but I think you can all uh, answer it in your own in your own way. Alexander, you wanna, you wanna kick us off? Sure, so um, I would, I, 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 I like probably everybody on this panel have worked really hard uh, my whole career. Um, but what is different about industry as compared to government is flexibility. And so in where I feel like I work as many hours as I ever have, um, the nice thing about my life now is I can sort of build those hours a little bit more around my life. Um, where when you work for a principal, uh, you are often subject to what I call the tyranny of the principal schedule. So like when you work for a member of Congress and your friend says, um, let's walk down the street to the Starbucks and get a coffee, you have to think, okay, is there any chance my member of Congress is going to need something in the next 20 minutes? And so wh- what I would say is that um, most of the really great jobs in the world uh, require a lot of hard work. Um, but there are some jobs that are right for different phases of life. So, you know, I have a, a young child and, and a family at home, and this is at the time in my life where probably I need more flexibility. Um, where earlier in my career, I didn't need uh, that flexibility and I was and the work was so intellectually rich and satisfying um, that I was willing to trade that and sort of live within the tyranny of the of the principal schedule. So I, my advice here would be that you get to live life in phases and you don't have, you know, there may be a phase where you need flexibility and or you need lo- less hours and you can seek it out at that time. Um, but also most of the really great jobs require a lot of hard work. Uh, Rose? Yeah, I, I agree with that 100%. I think my hours on the Hill, was on the Hill for almost nine years, um, were certainly more intense than they are now in terms of like hours of the day working and kind of time on call. I still work, I would say, uh, almost just as much, if not just as much, but it is, you know, I can decide if that's later at night or earlier in the morning, or if I you know, want to do some of that on a Saturday and instead, it's just the flexibility in the private sector is a little bit more. Um, to Alexander's point, you know, it's not, you have to think about what your member's doing. If votes are late at night, depending on your position, you're not going to be leaving the office. And you know, I, I will say some of that, I think, depends on the member of Congress. Each office is like a, a little world of its own. And my, I've had that been blessed to have two really great bosses on the Hill who prioritized family. And if you really you know, needed to do something or if you had to go pick up your kid at daycare, I don't have children, but others in the office did, then they would make that a priority. Um, but you would have to find a way to make it work. And that might mean you're you know, working from home for several hours at night. Um, the other thing I would say about that is just, when you're on the Hill or, or in the administration, you're a public servant and that's kind of what comes first. And that's like, that's incredibly rewarding and it's valuable. And I don't really think there's another experience like it, but it is, it, it's a commitment of your time and you have to kind of be willing to, to make it. Charles? Yeah, I, 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 again, I agree with what just said by both Sally Rose and Alexandra. Um, <clears throat> but, the, but the most important thing is sort of, you know, where you are in your life and what you value at that point. Um, and, and, and realizing that, 
you know, it, it's all a trade-off. But to Alexander's point, like cool jobs are hard. Um, you know, anything that, anything that you think is going to be worth doing is probably going to require long hours and hard work. Um, but again, uh, like I was saying earlier, I love my job. And, and, and most days, I'm like, you know, it, 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 it's long and it's hard, but it, it, it's rewarding. Um, and then the, what, I, what I will say, uh, because I know there's a lot of young people listening, the, the, one of the coolest things about the new folks coming up is um, that they, 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 you, you guys are shifting the value of uh, some of these things and, and, and putting life balance in, in the equation in a way that at least it wasn't, my generation just didn't um, for whatever reason. And I think that's really cool. Um, and I think that as more of you guys get in the workforce and, 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 and as employers want to be more competitive in hiring, these things will, become, will come more to the forefront in a way that they just didn't when I was coming up. And I, and I think it's a, it's a good thing. And then finally, like, you know, now that I, as you're coming up, you're sort of, like Alexander said, at the mercy of the schedule of the principal. And then, you know, at the mercy of like your, your people above you, right? The senior staff, obviously the member, you know, but then once you become the senior staff, you decide how you want to run your team and you decide how you, uh, where you want to put life balance uh, on, the, on the value structure. And, 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 and I've always, now that I'm, I'm the boss, I've always tried to respect that when people are off, they're off. Um, something that honestly, I, I didn't have when I was coming up, but to be on, but to even be more honest, something I didn't really ask for, nor that I feel I needed. Like, um, so it, it's hard and, and, and it's, it definitely comes in phases, but I think it's changing for the better and it's changing further down the, the, down the totem pole than when, you know, uh, I was a junior staff. Love it. All, all great points all around. Um, last question, and then, and then we'll let you guys go. And again, thank you so much for doing this. But um, if, you're a, if you were to rewind back to when you're an intern and you had someone walk up to you and give you a piece of advice, talking about planning your career forward. So if you're sitting at, at that intern desk uh, or at home right now and, and Zooming with the congressional staff, what, what advice would you give yourself about your career path? Is it important to have it all mapped out? Is it important to have an idea of the next couple of jobs? Because um, there's, there's varying degrees of perspective here. Um, and I think we've heard it kind of mixed in these answers too. Um, but um, Sally Rose, and then I'll go to Carlos so he can't say Alexander took his answer and then to Alexandra. Sally Rose? Yeah, I would say first, um, treat every day of your internship like a job interview because that's what it is. You're, you know, you're, have the opportunity to learn on the job, to learn the inner workings of an office, but also to put your best foot forward every day. Um, the second piece I would say is that you, you should have some idea, I think, of what you want to do, but you don't have to have it on a timeline. You don't have to have it super rigid. I mean, I, I will say I worked at or interned at the Georgia Republican Party before starting on the Hill, and I thought that I wanted to do fund, political fundraising. And it turns, I got to the Hill because I thought it was a good kind of way to check the box and, and do that. And it turns out I did not want to do political fundraising. I'm terrible at it. And I loved working on the Hill. And then I thought I wanted to do labor policy because that was the first issue I ever worked on on the Hill. And someone said, can you work on this? Can you help me? I did it, loved it. I also did not want to do labor policy at all. Um, and it, I think if I had stuck with that, I would have been somewhere completely different now, but I did know I wanted to do policy work um, once I started on the Hill. And so I kind of pursued opportunities in that space and looked to get more involved in legislative issues. So I think it's, it's definitely good to have an idea of what you want to do, but you don't have to have the perfect map. Carlos? Yeah, I would agree with Sally Rose. I, I, I think it is, I'm a big believer in that you want to have something to shoot at, something to aim for, um, but you want to stay flexible. Uh, if, I had, if, if I could go back and give myself, actually, I will tell you this, when I was, I, I was never an intern, but when I was a staff assistant, a friend of mine uh, who was a press secretary at the time uh, told me like, look, you, you, you're going to do cool things, just be patient. Um, and I think being when you're young, being told, be, being told to be patient is seems slightly patronizing, and uh, not what you want to hear. But that 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 and she also told me like if you're the first one in the office, 
you're 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 ahead of the game. Um, it's I wonder how it's going to be with like a new setup of virtual office, but like, but her advice was 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 incredibly helpful until I got to the speaker's office and everybody else got there early too. And I was like, man, I need, I need a new gig, a new a new strategy. Um, but the, sh the, the short of it is, I think you should have some kind of, or you should try to come up with some kind of outline, but be flexible. And, you know, if you are, if you are prepared, then when those opportunities present themselves that you weren't expecting, then you will be able to capitalize on them. So I guess my advice would be is get to work early and try to be prepared. <laughs> I am so honored to be able to say that Carlos's answer is exactly the answer I was going to give. Um, uh, what I was going to say was that I think you should have flexible aspirations. Um, and uh, one of the ways to really um, sort of uh, like develop those aspirations, understand them and, and shoot toward them is when you meet somebody who's doing a cool job, a, jo a job that you can imagine yourself doing in one year, five years, two, 10 years, uh, learn more about their job uh, and, and see if like upon closer study, it, is that a job that you would want uh, in, in that time horizon? Um, and, and the last point I would say is that um, as you think about uh, the one of the most beautiful things about Washington is that as you think about what you might wanna do in the future, no learning is ever wasted. So as you learn about things, as you cut like to Sally Rose's point, she thought, um, labor was the issue and then she learned more about labor and that wasn't the issue. I promise at many subsequent points in her career that learning she did about labor was n nonetheless uh, useful. So it's all sort of this beautiful part of the process of coming to understand this town, figuring out how it works uh, and just developing a full skill set that will help you accomplish whatever the, the job that you ultimately wanna have, um, help you get that job. That's it, Tom. Awesome, great. Well, thank you all and, and everyone watching this uh, either live or on YouTube. I hope you really take this advice to heart. Um, each of these individuals ha are superstars in their own right. Um, they're extremely impressive in uh, all that they've done and all that they do today. And they've reached this heights of this profession um, because of all the great advice that they've given to you that they've taken um, and they, they've learned from too. Um, got a couple other questions that we will try to respond on Twitter. Um, but uh, bottom line is, if you're looking for a job, whether it be a campaign, Capitol Hill job, private sector job, subscribe to our list, uh, check out our other resources. All these other folks have, have done other panels for us that we'll continue to post. Uh, and thank you all for doing this again. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Bye, guys.